invasion of 2008 and the massacre of civilians in Jenin in 2003 until, until exposed by the Robert Goldstone report and independent observers respectively, Israel is still denying again and hopes that this time the war crimes would be lost with the passage of time. But peace-loving nations of the world condemned this wanton aggression and demanded that the siege of Gaza be lifted and a UN-sanctioned inquiry be established to investigate into the massacre of the passengers of the Mavi Marmara. Knowing that the United States will not condemn its actions and veto any Security Council resolutions that demanded a full account for the accident, for the incident, Israel ignored international condemnation and maintained that she has the right to do as she likes. Israel considers itself above international laws and common moral values. This heinous murder of Turkish nationals and the confiscation of the Turkish ship Mavi Marmara seems strange to many, as Turkey has been a close strategic ally of Israel for many years, having regular joint military exercises and shared strategic interests. Turkey is also a NATO member. However, it is evident that even an ally would not be spared the criminal behavior of Israel, whether there is justification or not. Such is Israel's arrogance and her confidence that she can get away with murder. And indeed, Israel has been getting away with blatant murder since 1948. Many may have forgotten that such betrayal by Israel of an ally is not without precedent. The ally that was previously betrayed by Israel was none other than the United States. That treachery needs to be retold if we want to understand and appreciate the strategic implications of the attack on the Mavi Marmara. It was on the 8th of June, 1967, soon after the commencement of the Six-Day War by Israel against the, her Arab neighbors. President Johnson had given his consent to Israel to launch a limited war against Egypt on the condition that Israel would not widen the war to include any land grab against Jordan and Syria. Egypt had closed the Straits of Tehran to Israeli ships and the limited war was to compel Egypt to reopen the Straits of Tehran to Israeli ships. But the then Defense Minister Moshe Dayan had different ideas from what was agreed between President Johnson and the then Prime Minister of Israel, Levi Eshkol, and his military chief of staff, General Jizak Rabin. Moshe Dayan, the one-eyed war criminal, wanted to use the opportunity to extend the borders of Israel to fulfill the aspirations of the Zionists for a greater Israel. It was in the plan that after the capture of the Sinai Peninsula, Israeli military would be diverted to the Jordan and Syrian fronts. The USS Liberty was a spy ship belonging to the US and its mission was to listen to all Israel's military communication so that Israel would abide by the agreement not to widen the war after she attacked Egypt. The USS Liberty 
clearly stood in the way, as President Johnson would know through communication intercept by the USS Liberty, if Israel on its renege on its agreement for a limited war and proceeded to wage a full-scale war against all her immediate neighbors. This time was of the essence. If the USS Liberty was disabled, Israel would, be, would by her surprise attack against Syria and Jordan achieve her aims of a greater Israel before President Johnson could intervene to stop the wider war. General Moshe Dayan, therefore, ordered the attack on the USS Liberty that left 34 Americans dead and 175 wounded and severely damaged the ship. The captain of a nearby U.S. aircraft carrier scrambled jet fighters to assist the U.S. Liberty, but his orders were countermanded by President Johnson and Defense Secretary Robert McNamara. The excuse for the attack was that Israel made a mistake as to the identity of the US Liberty, USS Liberty. Moshe Dayan hailed the day of the attack, 8 June 1987, as a great day because the destruction of the USS Liberty enabled Israel to extend its borders to encompass, encompass the Golan Heights and the entire West Bank and more. The fact that President Johnson had to cover up the murder of his own soldiers and accepted thereafter the fed accompli of a greater Israel shows all too clearly that the United States was and is still subservient to Israel. The international mass media propaganda at the material time accused the Arab states for starting the war and wanting to annihilate Israel. Once again, we have to ask who is telling the truth. We need only to examine some public statements of Israel's military leaders at the given time. On 28th February 1968, Yitzhak Rabin, the Israeli chief of staff, in an interview with Le Mans, considered that, and I quote, I do not believe that Nasser wanted war. Close quote. The two divisions which he sent to Sinai on the 14th May would not have been enough to unleash an offensive against Israel. He knew it, and we knew it. That was what Yitzhak Rabin said. Menachem Begin, then Minister Without Portfolio, was quoted by the New York Times in 1982 as saying, in June 19, 1967, we had a choice. The Egyptian army concentrations in the Sinai approaches do not prove that Nasser was really about to attack us. We must be honest with ourselves. He, we decided to attack him. That was Menahem Begin. Given this hidden agenda, how did Israel prepare the propaganda for war against the Arabs? The strategy was simple enough. Portray Israel as the victim. In an interview with Al Hamishar Hamishmar in 1971, Mordecai Bento, then Minister of Housing, revealed, and I quote, the entire story of the danger of extermination was invented in order in every detail 